Hey, come on into the lab. Yes, indeed, we are in one of my lab spaces, which we converted to a video studio during the COVID-19 pandemic so that we could make these videos for you. And I wanted to give you a little behind the scenes look. So here we go. Cleo, thank you so much. Awesome videographer. Hannah O'Day, thank you very much, Hannah, for being here. Sebastian, sound man. Mr. Bones, he's an active listener. And our uh, ever-present green screen. Okay, here we go. So today we're gonna talk about muscle-driven simulations of walking. Now, it used to be impossible to generate a muscle-driven simulation of walking. Impossible, because think about what we're trying to do here. We need a mathematical model of the nervous system that sends excitation signals through your spinal cord out to muscles that coordinate the many muscles. We then need models of the biology of muscle and tendon and how they generate and transmit forces. And then the dynamics of the skeletal system and the interactions. We need to model all that physics as well and the feedback loops. So, of course, that used to be impossible. Amazingly, now we figured out how to do a reasonable job on all those parts so that we can generate muscle-driven simulations. And when we do, it's quite powerful. There are many applications. Think, for example, the application of designing an exoskeleton. This is a device from Exobionics that enables people with spinal cord injury to walk. But the design of exoskeletons is extraordinarily complex. And the crux of the challenge is the human-machine interaction. Having a predictive simulation that anticipates how the human will respond to an exoskeleton and designing optimal actuation of the exoskeleton to achieve a specific goal is one of the very powerful capabilities for muscle-driven simulations. So we're gonna get under the hood here and give you some specific uh, analyses that we can do with muscle-driven simulations. So our outline for the next few lectures is given here. So why do we create muscle-driven simulations? What's our motivation? We then want to use muscle-driven simulations to look at the uh, muscle actions during the stance phase, during the swing phase, and also during crouch gait, a very common uh, gait abnormality in individuals with cerebral palsy. We'll close out by looking the, at the effects of walking speed on muscle actions. We care about walking speed because, of course, we walk at different speeds, and many individuals who have physical limitations walk at a very slow speed. So we need to know muscle actions not at just self-selected typical speed, but also at much slower and much faster speeds. So that's the plan going forward. So, why do we create muscle-driven simulations? I spent the first 15 years of my career working with other experts to determine the causes of gait differences in children with cerebral palsy. We used all the information we had available from experiments and clinical exams, and we did our best to plan treatments that would improve individuals' ability to walk. For example, the girl shown in this video has cerebral palsy and walks in a crouch gait. Her knees hurt from the high loads in her joints, and she expends more energy walking than other kids do. So we'd have a video like this, and in addition, we would review an extensive report that showed all of the joint angles, all the joint moments, EMG patterns, clinical measures of strength, but we still didn't know what was causing her crouch gait. Was it tight hamstrings? Was it weak plantar flexors? If it was tight hamstrings, she'd be a good candidate for hamstring surgery. Weak plantar flexors, maybe more physical therapy or braces. We'd see patient after patient with crouch gait, for example, and we didn't know the contributing factors. In this case, again, was it tight hamstrings or was it tight hip flexors? Maybe they needed a, a lengthening of the hip flexor muscles to get them more erect and less crouched. So, we need to understand the actions of muscles during typical gait and during crouch gait to determine the causes of crouch gait so we can devise optimal treatments. So we began developing muscle-driven simulations. And this is just a, a set of frames from a muscle-driven 
simulation where you can see the, the motions of the body and you can see the timing and intensity of muscle activations. So, so far we've explored in the book up to chapter 11 the form, the function, and simulation of muscle. And now we arrive back where we started in chapter 2 with the desire to understand walking. But now we have new tools that can give us much deeper understanding. So in chapter 2, we used models that were just comprised of a few mechanical linkages representing legs. And while these simple models were really valuable, they don't tell us the actions of muscles. Legs have muscles, and that what generates the force to keep us from falling down and to propel us forward. Muscles let us carry a backpack, change our walking speed, or transition from walking to running. So in these next few lectures, and in chapter 11 of your book, we'll see how muscles are coordinated to produce typical walking and how the dynamics change with speed. We'll also look at why poorly coordinated muscles result in atypical gait, such as crouch gait. So an important use of muscle-driven simulations is to extend the insights we gain from experiments. For example, it's possible to measure muscle activity, but I can see the activity in a muscle, but I don't know how much action force that muscle is generating and how that's producing ground reaction force. And that's, for example, why we couldn't figure out the girl or the boy in that video had crouch gait. We don't know what's actually limiting their capacity to stand upright and to support their body weight. So that's our plan moving forward. The process for creating muscle-driven simulations is shown here. Let's talk about how we build, test, and analyze muscle-driven simulations. The process goes like this. It includes modeling musculoskeletal dynamics, shown here, simulating a movement, so that's when we determine the coordination pattern that produces a simulated coordinated movement. We then need to test, and I put testing in the middle because at every stage we're testing a musculoskeletal simulation. And then step four here where we analyze the simulation to understand and answer a specific scientific questions. So to build a simulation, we start with a generic musculoskeletal model. We tailor that to represent an individual subjects based on the landmarks we measure during experiments. We then simulate the activations, as I outlined in chapter 10, and test the accuracy. And once we have confidence in the accuracy, we can analyze and, and move on and gain some insight.